Real Sounds of Africa to once again kick off the World Football Phone-In. As ever, we're talking football in South America with the legend Dino Tim Vickery and we're talking football in Europe uh, with the one and only Colonel Mina Rizuki. We're talking football in those regions and, of course, talking football uh, footballers from those regions playing in our leagues as well. 08085 is the number to call. 08085 uh, Which of you is making the most noise in the background there? Are you having a Me. drink of water? Are you have, I knew it. I knew it. <laughs> I, I knew it. it. I was only being polite by drawing Tim into the conversation. <laughs> I, just, I just felt really hot. So I can I make this as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's not okay. watered him. Yeah. Well, who knows? That's who ice. knows? What happens that's ice, in, ice, baby. What happens in Rio? Oh, very good. Very good. Yay. First point to him then on this one. Although points is not the right game, Tim. It's not the right game. This is football. What we're looking for is goals. 08085 If you've got any questions on football in either Europe or South America, players from over there playing in our leagues for Mina and Tim, then do let us know. I suppose we've got to start off with the really sad news of uh, Emiliano Sala, uh, Tim. Uh, both Tim and Mina, actually, because this is a player from Argentina who played in France. Tragic story. His plane's gone missing. His family still believe there is hope for him. Um, over the His plane went missing over the English Channel. Uh, he was on his way to Cardiff where he was... Um, he'd been signed for a club record fee and he was going to help Cardiff out of their own... Uh, footballing dilemmas, been signed from Nantes and he, I think it's been one of the most tragic stories that I've heard of because mm. I can't help thinking of what this this young man, 28 years old, had dedicated his life to and, you know, if you think, if you cast your minds back to where he started his apprenticeship in football and he died on his way to doing a great job, I imagine, Tim. Yeah, and uh, he wasn't particularly well known in in Argentina, and he, he played his entire professional career abroad, and especially in France. So, uh, to many in Argentina, they had to kind of explain who he was, but that doesn't lessen the impact of the story there, because th this really is such an Argentine story. Uh, it's so easy for the Argentine people to rep to 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 recognise Salah as one of their own. Because, you know, he's a kid from nowhere, a tiny little town in the middle of nowhere, football obsessed, got a dream, maybe wasn't naturally the most talented uh, player in the world, but a few showed more dedication to go after the, that, that and, and to plunge into the deep end, you know, to, to go abroad at a very, very early age. Uh, and it, it's such an Argentine story. It shows the depth which football reaches in Argentina science society and the dedication with which so many uh, are, are willing to, to chase that dream so it's a story that really has a hit home even to people who maybe two weeks ago weren't entirely sure who he was yeah I mean even though most of us wouldn't have known who he was i'm sure cardiff city fans have been learning up and reading up about him and i do want to hear from them as well if you are a cardiff city fan uh, tonight you want to pay tribute to Salo, then feel free, 08085 But, Mina, over the trajectory of the last season, certainly for Nantes, for Nantes, he'd been quite good, hadn't he? He'd been quite successful. Yeah, he really had been. This is a really... It, it, obviously, I, I follow European football, and I do, and I watch as many games as I can. And this season, I've tended to veer more towards Italian football because I'm always in Italy. And on Sunday... Uh, I do a podcast on Monday mornings and they said to me, right, you know, we want a one minute monologue on Emiliano Sala and we want you to tell us everything about him. And I was like, you know what? I haven't watched enough of him and I don't know that much of him. I, I know he's been really, really amazing uh, under Valid Halotsevic. I really struggled to say his name. Halil Halotsevic. I, I probably still didn't get it right. Yeah, the Nantes coach. Just thank you, lucky stars that Desikan hasn't been appointed. Yeah, honestly, I have such trouble with certain names anyway. And um, um, anyway, so they said to me at the time, you know, okay, well, like, I was like, all right, fine. So I've got to go over to somebody who had Y Scout and loads of different things and just w watch videos of him. And I prepared this, like, you know, in-depth study of him and, you know, and then the podcast started. And then we got into a fight 
probably about Pep Guardiola because I seem to always fight with this issue with everyone. And I don't know what happened, but basically we didn't have the time to do the one minute monologue that I'd spent all my Sunday preparing, you know? And at the end of it, I was like, guys, we have to find a way like of slipping this in. And they were like, you can't because, you know, it doesn't matter. You can just do it next week because by then, you know, you never know. Maybe he scored a hat trick already. And it, when I saw the news after that about a man who's finally fulfilling his like his dreams of finally coming true at the age of 28, which is all for a footballer, you just think, oh, my God, like the guy never stopped believing that he would, you know, make it into the Premier League, make it into a, a team. Like I know Cardiff is obviously not like, you know, Barcelona, but he, for him it was. And it, it's like the most tragic thing because you can't look away from it. It's made me not actually want to watch the news, if I'm honest. Um the way that Cardiff fans have embraced him as their own and they've laid tribute to him and I've spoken to a few of them and they genuinely believe he's their own. Like, they don't think he's a non-player or who they don't have any connection to. They feel a deep connection to a man that they've yet to meet, that they've yet to see him play in their colours. And this was a man who was a journeyman in, in, in France, you know, Bordeaux, like, learned him out, wanted to get him more experienced at the time. It just seemed to be that it was never really working out for him. And he was, you know, that typical striker is always really good in the box, but did he do enough? You know, like, is he consistent enough? And then he comes to Nantes, and I think it was in 2015. And this last season, he's second only to Kylian Mbappe um, and Nicolas Pepe as well, um, Lille's uh, top scorer. And he's just been this guy that everyone's like, oh, well, you know what? Emiliano Salah has found the right connection. He's like scoring. He's good in the air. He he seems to have good feet as well. He's got great instincts. His reactions are really quick, um, determined. And this is a guy who wants to make his dreams come true. And this is the chance. It's Cardiff, you know, uh, he, he's going to the Premier League. He's going to get paid a lot more money. And at the time when they asked the coach of Nantes, you know, how do you feel about losing this man because he's been so important to your style of play he's been so important to your football not just historically a team last year that Claudio Ranieri coached and who Neymar didn't want to play against because they're so defensive and he said I just I really don't want to play 90 minutes where I'm being attacked and fouled non-stop but this guy made their football just to have an, an end product and they asked you know the coach how do you feel about losing him? And he goes, listen, let's be honest. Cardiff offered him six to seven times the salary. If I'm in, you know, if I've been offered the same, I would probably make the same decision. So we can't compete. Good luck to him. And this is a guy that fought hard for his dream and it's coming true. And, you know, I hope he gets everything he wants. And so what a tragic ending, if it is indeed an ending. And, and I thought that was an excellent tribute from you, actually. I know you did mean it as a tribute, but in summation, it is a tribute at the end of the day. And really, that's G'd me, my enthusiasm about this programme up, because I won't lie, and I'm sure many football fans out there would <clears throat> have been depressed over the last few days, because, like you say, it, it is... You know, the, the way that you express that, that Cardiff may not be Barcelona to everybody else, but it was for him... I think really, you know, encapsulates this dream of football glory for a lot of the young people. Anyway, that aside, 08085 909 If there are Cardiff fans out there or Nantes fans out there or Bordeaux fans that can add any more to um, what I thought was an excellent tribute there uh, from the Colonel, then feel free, 08085 909 Lots to talk about this morning. Of course, the other issue that... You might want to talk about, uh, Colonel, is that tonight Thierry Henry was sacked from Monaco. Well, that's a surprise. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah. Could okay, you want my opinion, or you're just well, uh... how how badly could he have done? He's only been there for three months. I mean, his to be honest, his arrival made no sense to me whatsoever. I thought it was the poorest decision to make in football, akin to Neville going to Valencia. Um, it was like you just cannot have the strategy that Monaco have and think Thierry Henry, of all people, yeah, a guy. Also, you, you know, I have an issue with great, great players becoming coaches. I don't think it ever works out. I mean, we've had how many debates on even Johan Cruyff? Yeah. <laughs> That's probably maybe the only one that I can tell you, okay, but it, they struggle. Really great players. Ancelotti has been, was a good player maybe, yeah, too. But this was a guy that they hired because they didn't think Hardim got enough people into the press conferences, you know? 
And it was, you know, you've changed your strategy. You're no longer buying guys on the cusp of, of expressing your, their potential. You're now buying just potential that needs years to develop. And, you know, you're no longer like you're selling off your best talents year in and year out. And you have Khadim, who everyone criticized their decision when they first brought him in because he was considered so defensive. But you know why he was so defensive? Because they had a defensive team. So, in fact, if anything, he was pragmatic. He did his best job. They were amazing. They started to climb the ladder. They were given the life that he was given, Carrasco and Martial. And we saw them run to the semi final and play beautiful attacking football, especially with Kylian Mbappe eventually. You strip him of all his best parts and he's going to suffer. You take a guy away like that, you know, Khadim leaves because he just doesn't know what more he's supposed to build with a team that really has no direction. And you think Thierry Henry, because he can attract a crowd and a lot of newspaper articles is going to make the difference. Did you see, I don't know if any of you saw this in the press conference before the Champions League, and he was with a young defender, uh, you know, answering questions from the press. And then he gets up and the defender gets up, but he doesn't push his seat back in. And rather than just push the seat back in so he can move, he makes him come back, push his seat back in, so then he can walk out. If you need to do that in front of everyone taking pictures, then I don't think, for me, you're the kind of guy that you should really be in Monaco in charge of developing youth if you've already embarrassed them in front of everyone. Like, there's just... It was more like it's a name, it's a strategy. I mean, if you're a great player, you're never going to understand guys who don't know how to do all the things that you knew how to do as a player as well. Lota Matea spoke a bit in great detail about how hard it is for a good player to be a good coach. And more importantly, if ego becomes a thing where he's saying, well, not enough guys care about this, not enough guys are willing to give me everything on the pitch. Yeah, maybe if you were a little bit nicer to them in front of the press, then they'd, they'd be willing to do everything for you. You know, they've gone you Fabregas, they're trying to get you all the players that you think are going to improve the squad. Let's be honest, the strategy was wrong. It's a sinking ship. You know, a lot needs to change at the moment. And you're definitely not the answer because you don't have the experience or the CV to know what it means to suffer at this level. Tim, is, is Mina still on her soapbox? Sorry. <laughs> Uh, well, she's uh, nice to know that she's come back from her holiday so tolerant and uh, and fresh. <laughs> 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 By the way, I would have slept thought that, three uh, weeks. that Dubai might have a different effect, you know. No, but there you go. No, I no. didn't go to Dubai. I went to Mexico. Well, Mexico. See, they've never slept uh, since. See, they've probably never heard of Solsha in Mexico, um, who is an ex footballer that's doing really well for Manchester United. You might have heard of him, Mina. And then, of course, there are a couple of other people that we'd like to mention. Didier Deschamps, of course. Uh, Franz Beckenbauer didn't do too badly. Uh, Klinsmann, Jurgen Klinsmann. Uh, should, should we pause there for a I, moment? I would throw in Pep Guardiola, but then, oh, then would, ret- retreat to a safe distance. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll come back to this. No, in a you're moment. right. There are. You're right. There actually are. You've just pointed out really a lot of good examples. To be honest, yeah. Solskjaer, come on. It's been like eight games. Yeah, like let's get not get carried away. He still hasn't been you know forced to suffer. But you know what? He could end up being really good. You have named a few names, but. I just think that when you give them a project as big as Monaco's, with the strategy, with the trouble they've had, it's and, and it's like Gary Neville being given Valencia at the time. They had so many internal problems, and Valencia is such a big club in Spain with a lot of pressure from those fans who won't accept anything but brilliance. It's like delusions of grandeur. Well, actually, they are bigger than Roma, but Roma is another big problem like that in Italy. It's difficult because you're okay. thrown in the, like it's a baptism of fire. Yeah. So welcome back, Mina. We've got Russell in Enfield. <laughs> <laughs> Russell in Enfield is with us. Hello, Russell. Hello. How is everybody? Very well, thanks very much. Excellent. You can hear Mina's back on top form. <laughs> yes, oh, critical as ever. Yeah, we missed her. We missed her. I, I think she spent her holiday being pickled in acid or something. I think that's what happened. That's what happened to her. Honestly, I'm still suffering from jet lag. I've had food poisoning. I've had everything you can imagine. So I'm just not in a great mood these days, yeah. Russell. Uh, <laughs> oh, that's all right. That's all right. Nothing a good defensive performance from Juve won't sort out, I'm sure. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> As long as Ronaldo um, tracks back, I'm fine. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Can I first say also just to extend my um, sympathies to everyone obviously involved in the Emiliano Sala situation. Um, Awful news, isn't it, this week? Um, Really, uh, it's looking unlikely there's a good conclusion to it, but really, really hope there's still some way uh, there could be some good conclusion to it, but uh, not looking great. Um, 
in, in other news, I see Dalton's team's doing all right at the moment. Not too bad. About time the to, About time too, mate. About time too. Yeah. Wasted years. Yeah. Wasted years. <laughs> the wasted years is what I'll call my book about following that team. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But thank you. Well, that goes from goes for most teams, um, including mine. I'm, I'm a Brighton fan, as I think you might know from previous calls. But I'm, I wanted to phone today to ask Tim about um, our new signing. Uh, we've got um, from Argentinos Juniors, we've signed Alexis Mac Allister, um, who's been loaned back. I think he's on a four-and-a-half-year deal with us. Um, and I wanted to just get um, Tim's views on him, what he knows about him, what he can tell us, and um, what we can expect, really, when he comes over in the summer. And let's forget. Let's not forget. He's... Last night was Burns' night as well. McAllister might have uh, some say in that. <laughs> exactly. You might yeah. think it, it's an unlikely surname for for an Argentine footballer, but there's a whole dynasty of him. And I, I well remember his dad, Carlos McAllister, who uh, was a kind of little, uh, kind of red-haired, balding left back who very, very nearly went to the 1994 World Cup. And he's got a hole. You know, he's. Bred them all. Um, Alexis McAllister in Argentinos Juniors he plays with his two older brothers, Kevin and Francis. The idea of Kevin McAllister in the Argentine league is, uh, is, <laughs> is uh, um, something that uh, I, always, I love the fact that there's a Kevin Valderrama walking out, walking around there somewhere as well. I'm, I'm told that the hold up with the Alexis McAllister deal, well, he's called McAllister, he doesn't have an EU passport. So Brighton couldn't bring him over now. They don't have any spots left for non-EU players and the uh, regulations wouldn't allow him to be loaned to the championship. So for the moment, they haven't got the money because they've paid the money and they haven't got the player. So he's back. At, uh, uh, he's, uh, that's why he's uh, still at Argentinos for, for the next few years. He's a very classy young midfielder. Um, only only just, turned, uh, just turned 20. He can dictate play from deep. And he gets in the box as well. He's a uh, good timing of his runs in, in, into the box. The question mark against him for Premier League football is how physically slight he is. They're a fairly small breed, the uh, the, the McAllisters. His old, his old man was a little bit squatter than, uh, than, than he is. So that, that, that's a big question mark against him. Um, whether he's going to get crowded out in, uh, in, in Premiership midfields. But he can, it, there, there's a lot of quality there, a lot of promise. Someone who sees the game well, picks out the pass and he's mobile. He's not going to give a pass and then stand on his haunches. He's given the pass and he's going. And I love that kind of midfielder who gets into the period. That gives you so many more options. So I like him a lot. I hope it will work out well for him. The, the one question mark would be his lack of physicality. Of course, there's okay. another question mark. Is he a goal hanger? Oh, <laughs> uh, yes. I see what you did there. <laughs> Um, well, he might be. He might be. Who knows? Um, but it's certainly the sort of player we need, actually, I think. Um, do you think Tim that he could benefit from um, a, an integration into a, another European division on another loan deal, perhaps, before he comes to us fully? The, the, the only problem with that is that I'm always suspicious of loan deals. Uh, when mm. when a, a player comes across and he's loaned out to a club who don't have any long-term stake in him, and don't really care. They just don't care if he doesn't come off. Or, you know, it's just not important to them. Uh, I think that the Argentines are perhaps mentally stronger than some nationalities to deal with that. But that, that can go wrong so many times. If you're loaned out, you don't feel important, you don't feel wanted. You know, he's flavour of the month in Argentina at the moment, so he feels special. And then he, he goes to somewhere where he's just another member of a big squad with a club that have no long-term interest in him. That, that, and ideally, you'd want him over now. I mean, uh, I'm, 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 we're hijacking the 2.30 news a little bit, but just briefly, uh, Thiago Silva, when he came across the, 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 the great centre-back from Brazil to Milan, they couldn't mm. use him for a while. So they just trained him for six months and they taught him how to operate in European football. And he's quick, but in Brazil he played very, very deep, as they often do, the, the, the defensive lines. Um, so, uh, you know, they had six months to drill him, drill him, drill him, drill him. And by the time he could play, he, was, he had already been bedded in on the training ground. So uh, I wonder for a club in Brighton situation m whether it might not be better to bring him over now and just let him settle in off the field, get him on the training ground and work with him. And so by the time his, his first team opportunity comes at the start of next season, um, everything's not strange to him. Um, it, it might be a little bit, a bit presumptuous on my behalf, but that's what I would do if I was in Brighton's uh, shoes. Mm. OK, thanks, Tim. Cheers, that's appreciated. Well, let's hope he does well anyway when he comes in. I'm really looking forward to seeing him play.
Um, and so, Russell, thanks for the please. question as well. No, thank you. Uh, caught up any time, by the way. Thank you for the question and also Fantastic. your sentiments about Salah. I think we're right on point there. Thank you very much. Uh, great way to kick off the first call of this programme tonight. Oh, Russell. Russell, you OK, still... thanks a lot. Yeah, Russell, I was going to say, Russell. Yeah. Uh, just before you go... I was going to yep. say, would you like to do us the honour of introducing uh, our, <laughs> our, our news for tonight, our newsreader? I know you don't have a Brazilian shirt name, but if I say to you, excuse me whilst I kiss the sky. <laughs> <laughs> OK. <laughs> excuse me while I kiss the sky. No, no, I'm, I'm saying that. And then you, <laughs> you basically say what the name of the newsreader is when I say that. Oh. Oh, yes. Um, yes, I can't quite remember his name. Can you give me a quick reminder first? Mitch. <laughs> Mitch. OK. <laughs> so I'm saying, excuse me whilst I kiss the sky, and then you say, here's a Five Live News with his full name. OK, yeah, no worries. Excuse <laughs> me whilst I kiss the sky. Mitch. <laughs> <laughs> No, let me let me try this again. But thank you, Russell. Well done. I'll tell you somebody who can do it. Yeah. It's not Mina, it's the Legendino. So, Legendino, excuse me whilst I kiss the sky. No, it's not you, Jimmy. It's not even Noel Redding. It is Mr. Mitch Mansfield. This is BBC Radio 5 Live. Available on the BBC Sounds app. Up all night with Dotton Adebayo. Yeah, World Football Phony this morning is Europe and South America with the Colonel Mina Rizuki. Uh, taking your calls and questions on football in Europe and players from over there playing in our leagues as well. And the legend, you know, Tim Vickery, answering any questions or comments you might have on football in South America and players uh, from that region playing in our leagues as well. Amina, if I say mm -hmm. to you, excuse me whilst I kiss the sky, what would you say? Uh, introduce the segment, uh, introduce the news. Yeah, exactly. Uh, who's reading the news tonight? Mitch. Yeah, that's good enough. That's good enough. That's good enough. I'm glad to hear that because the whole, in case anybody's listening, wondering what this is all about, last week I made a faux pas, even though, you know, I, I've, I've brought this kid up like a like a son, you know, I'm, I'm like the godfather to him. Mitch Mansfield, this is, he's reading our news tonight. Yeah, yeah exactly. Sure. I'm like a godfather to him, you know, I brought him up like a son. I made him enough, he could refuse, and then I got his name <laughs> wrong, okay? I got his name wrong <laughs> just once, just <laughs> once, just once, I got his name wrong. And, of course, uh, Mitch, didn't Tim take the mickey out of me last week for that? He certainly did, but he's a fine one to talk because uh, he's actually got my name wrong before. Believe really? It really? really? Going back no. some time now. Are you saying James, that the James, pot James. called the kettle black? I am. This was going back, I would say, maybe 2006. It doesn't I matter would have been how far back. 13 or 14. And yeah. Tim, you might remember you used to do a bit of a QA on the BBC Sport website. You used to do a blog doing a QA on South charged. American football. And I remember yeah. how excited I used was. Used to is the operative word. Well, yeah. indeed. We all miss it. No, I, it's not. No, it's not. I was so excited to yeah. see that one of my questions had finally been selected to be answered <laughs> by the legend Tim Vickery. Uh, only to see that you'd refer to me as Mitch from Mansfield. <gasps> no. <laughs> no. I thought, I can't wait to show my mates this. Look, no. I'm on the BBC Sport website and <laughs> he's got my that? bloody name wrong. He, well, easy on the language, mate. Oh, excuse you know, me. This is a BBC after all. <laughs> uh, this is, this is, you know got to articulate the heartbreak, Dutton. I know. You articulated it very well. I think we can now put a full stop <laughs> under any references to Jimi Hendrix in the future from Tim Vickery. Yeah? Should we call oh, it you're such a voodoo child. Should we draw a line under this? If it makes you feel any better, I forgot my boyfriend's name the other day. <laughs> <laughs> your ex-boyfriend, your ex-boyfriend's name. I was introducing him somewhere and I'm like, and that, oh dear. What the it's easily done, it's easily done. <laughs> You're forgiven, Tim. Dutton, you've still got work to do. Uh, uh, I'm not sure about that. I feel it's Mina that's got work to do, mate, not me. I know my wife's name. You mean name. Mina from Rizuki? <laughs> yeah, that's the one. <laughs> that's hey, listen, I, I do a show where they still call me Rizuki. I'm like, it's been four years I've done this show. Like, someone's got to have told you. That's not how you say it. <laughs> Don't tell them. Don't, oh, Kelly. I do. <laughs> so I do Arzuki's the little one on Godzilla, isn't it? 
<laughs> no, someone asked me if I was related to the Suzuki Godzi family. <laughs> yeah, Godzilla and Arzuki I'm being told here. I don't know what Well, I am a gremlin. So. <laughs> well, there you go. Uh, let me introduce you to a Brazilian shirt holder. There aren't many of them who get to come into the studio, but it is one of the Ooh. privileges, isn't it, of being a Brazilian shirt holder. You get to come into the studio with us. Oh, by the way, somebody, somebody's already suggested that just to help you out, Nina, that we mm. should give Desik and Thiru Nayanapuram a Brazilian shirt name. Oh, that would be nice. He would. He would. Be. I'm going to ask him. I'm going to ask him. We'll, we'll, we'll work it out so that you're never embarrassed like that again. Uh, so mean, that Tim, what's his name again? Tim, Tim, Tim. I, I can't remember what his name is. No, I do not know myself. But here in the studio, Brazilian shirt holder Joel Dowson is with us. Hello. Uh, good morning, mate. How are you? I'm very well, thanks very much. Oh, you're Brazilian shirt holder. So why am I calling you Joel? What is your name? So I'm... The Revelino Junior. Uh, my Revelino Junior. father is a reverend. Uh, oh, right. That was uh, it. Yeah. Uh, Your father's a reverend. You're Revelino Junior. <laughs> and you actually went out and bought a Brazilian shirt. I bought a Brazilian <laughs> shirt with it on the on the back, number 10. Number 10. Um, so. Now, we all know that number 10 is a hard shirt to claim, you know. Well, mm. I, I thought I could just about pull it off. Um, I'm not as good as Zico. Take I'm not going to claim to be. If you're going to pull it off, take it off. <laughs> um, boom, yeah. boom. Anyway, uh, great to have you on the programme. So you're going to join us now for the next hour and a half, an hour and a quarter. You see, I'm talking so much. We've only got an hour and a quarter of the phone in to go. 0808 If you want to stop me talking so much, then give us a call. Darren is with us in London. Good morning, Darren. Hi, darling. How are you? You OK? Very well, thanks very much. We've got Revelino Jr. with us, as well as Mina and Tim. Uh, feel free to throw any question you want and uh, make sure it's like a boomerang. It comes straight back to you. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, my question is for uh, uh, Mina. Hi, Mina. Hi, how are you? Oh, I'm okay, I am. How are you? You okay? Yeah. I'm well. She's never that nice to her boyfriend, Darren. What have you done? <laughs> she can't even remember his name. I, know, that's I just hard. have a really bad memory, okay? <laughs> I got robbed, and then the police were like, was it a man or a woman? I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> Sometimes it's difficult to tell the difference. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> just, I don't know the stuff. Yes, okay. you were saying, Darren. <laughs> oh, um, yeah. Uh, with uh, the Champions League returning in a few weeks' time, uh, what mm -hmm. is the views on the Madrid versus Juventus game? Because when both teams play at the best, they're both quite similar. Because both yeah. are um, outstanding um, put, um, at the back, and also both have star attackers up front as well. So, do you both think are... Juventus, do you think Ju uh, Juventus will win? Or do you think Madrid could actually improve in terms of some of their form? So no people have been saying, yeah, the Golden has not been playing well. But I'd probably put that down to the World Cup, really. Because when you look at someone like uh, Varane uh, uh, Madrid, mm. he, had a, he had such a great World Cup, he really had a poor season so far. But I could probably see him probably um, be coming back to his best form. At the um, in the second half of the season for Real Madrid, but uh, what's your views on you very Madrid then? It's a really hard one to um, uh, to really think who's going to come out on top because you're right; they almost cancel each other out. They're very similar in the way they play their football. With Diego Godin, I agree with you on Rafael Varane, and I think that's a really good point, and I feel like people don't remember that. You know, when, when people look at Madrid and they just think, why are they falling apart? This is Real Madrid. You know, like Modric uh, it, it, and Varane, and there's a lot of guys that reach the final. It's exhausting to continue every day, you know? And obviously their fitness coach changed in the beginning um, when they had Lopetegui, and now they've gone back to the old one, so there's a lot of injuries they had to cope with, the loss of Ronaldo. There's many things but with Diego Godin, I agree with you that the World Cup had an effect on him. Um, he is leaving in the summer. He's joining Inter on a ludic ludicrously expensive contract, in my opinion. But, you know, he is one of the best centre-backs. I don't know whether he's going to find his form. I mean, he has six months, so there is going to be a part of him that wants to do his very best. But for me, there's a huge... <sighs> It's just not working at the moment for them. And, you know, Diego Costa is not uh, scoring as much as he used to. There seems to be a disconnect. One thing that worries me is Alvaro Morata joining them, I think, can change a lot. Um, because what he loves is, is a good defending team, and then he can counter if there's a possibility of him doing that. And you feel like Cholo Simeone will know how to get the best out of him. 
um, and he'll be back in Madrid where he's grown up and, and he could make the difference. But this is the Juventus side that, you know, I mean, if there's any year that we're going to face Atletico, then I would want it to be this year. Uh, largely because I think they're not the team of old. They're struggling at the back in ways that they never did. And it's just not based on Godin only, but the entire sort of, you know, even Felipe Luis, I don't think has been great all the time. It, there's, there's, there seems to be a disconnect um, in the way that they're defending. And the way that they play their football under Cholo, it, it comes a little bit, it's quite hard after a while to continue motivating, motivating yourself to do similar things when, you know, your forward line is not coming to play and, you know, you're, you're not really going to win the league because even when, I mean, everyone's been bad, obviously, but with Juventus, this is the best team I've seen them have in the last seven years. And they've got Cristiano Ronaldo, they've got Bonucci back, they've got Allegri who knows and, and has been with the team for so long now. And they've got options off the bench which they haven't had in any of the Champions League finals in which they face Barcelona and Real Madrid. You looked and they had the likes of, you know, who did they have to bring on at the time? I don't even remember. It was Mario Lemina. You know, they didn't even have great options to bring off the bench. Um, now you've got, you know, Federico Bernadeschi, you've got Douglas Costa, if Mandzukic is not available, or Paolo Dybala, um, who's now happy in this midfield role where he can create. You've got Ronaldo, obviously, who's a match winner and always does something special, leads the team. You've got Pjanic, who's a better player now because he seems to have more experience. And Khadir is getting old, but then you've got Emre Chan, you've got Ben Tanko, you've got Blaise Matuidi. There are options everywhere. And if Team A isn't going to work, then Team B can also do something. So if they can't overcome this Madrid side that are, are conceding goals left, right and centre to the likes of Corona, then in, for me, then they don't deserve to go any further. I would put my money on Juve winning the entire thing this season just because of the team that they've created and the fact that they have stability, which many teams don't have at the moment, um, and consistency in the first team. And this is an Atletico side that are suffering defensively that don't have a goal scorer at the moment that scored as much as it doesn't seem to feel, you know, this great power that he used to before in Costa. Um, there is hangovers, of course, from the World Cup because Griezmann did reach the final and he, he is very, you know, he's tremendous, don't get me wrong, but there's something for me where the, it's starting to wind down over there. And yes, they had a great performance against Borussia Dortmund, but it took the first time Dortmund scored four goals over them. Don't get me wrong, Lucien Favre is the king, you know, and I'm a huge fan of him. He's a wonderful coach, probably the best in Germany at the moment. But he shouldn't be able to score that many goals over Cholos and Mjolnir's side. And the fact that he did makes me think that we should be able to too. Mina, in terms of, this is the Revelino Jr. here, um, in terms of Atletico Madrid, obviously their, their transfers in the last few seasons, I think, have been a real a point of, of a negative for them, obviously, Signing mm, Lamar, Lamar in the summer hasn't really worked out. You've, you've, no. um, Costa's not really worked out since coming back. And their defence, like, they've got um, uh, the younger Uruguayan, who name escapes me at this time, the centre-back with Godin. But, yeah, Jimenez. Jimenez but, yeah. yeah, but they're, they're pretty ageing at the back as well. Is, is that something that they need to look into uh, more? Well, yeah, I think so. I think to many, it's a good thing that Diego Godin is leaving. The fans are really upset about it, obviously, because he's God. And and the only reason why I'm like, he should be better is because, yes, he played in the World Cup, but he played how many games exactly? Because Uruguay got knocked out, you know? Um, and I do think Jimenez is a wonderful centre-back, but you, you sort of, it's quite hard for a team to recover when you're losing or when you're top performer at the back. It's like, imagine... Um, I'm trying to imagine the English team with like Im imagine Virgil van Dijk is getting on you know it's really hard for that team to find their rhythm and All Black is obviously used to him and when he's making weird mistakes that he would never make usually it's 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 starting to worry a few of them and yes that they are aging and there needs to be a, but it's not just because of their age I also think it's the style of play um, it's a little bit exhausting and and you know that Diego Simeone wants to evolve the side. He wants to move it forward. He wants, he's tried different things and he tried that from the second season that he joined, you know, trying to make them a, a little bit different. But it's hard because of the players that he's got because like you said, the transfer strategy hasn't really fitted all the time. They've brought people in like Carrasco. It didn't work out for them, you know. Costa, they brought back in because he was so amazing for them. It didn't work out for them. They're always on this, is Griezmann going to leave? Is he going to stay? Is he going to leave? Is he going to stay? Then he had to create a whole video to say, actually, I'm going to stay. There's always this feeling of everyone's just doing their job, but you don't know the direction anymore. It's quite hard to continue to motivate your, your team every week when you're playing that kind of football. Okay, Darren, thanks a lot for the call. 0808590969. 
three if you'd like to join in this uh, conversation this evening. So we're talking ostensibly football in Europe and South America and players from over there playing our leagues. But, you know, feel free to take it whatever permutation that you wish. We've already had a, a couple of suggestions for a Brazilian shirt name for Desica and Thiru Nayanapuram. Um, you can go for whichever one you like. Des you can or Des... <laughs> Yes, you can't. Uh, Jake in Dundalk. <laughs> well, it's an obvious one, isn't it? Uh, thank you for those so far. What about Higuain? Talking of which, Tim, um, this question here from Martin Anglesey, Brazilian shirt holder himself. Uh, he says, look, uh, can you ask your guests on their views on Higuain's move to Chelsea, asking as a fantasy football manager? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, I'll, I'll ping this one over to, to Mina very shortly because uh, she's followed him at club level much more closely. And I had him for about a year, you know, about a year. And then you kind of wave him off into the airport. And there you go. Uh, with me kind of South American hat on. And he's the man who messed up final after final after final. You know, there's three <laughs> finals that Argentina got to. The World Cup in 14, the Copa America in 15, the Centenary Copa America in 16, all of them. He has the big chance, and in all of them, all of them, he uh, he, he made made a hash of it, uh, and sometimes looking like he's carrying too much weight, uh, and uh, I I couldn't understand why they even bother taking him to the last World Cup. He he, he looked like he was pulling a tractor behind him, um, so that that's the doubt that the doubt I have uh, I have about him going into the Premier League at, at this stage in his career. Having said that. He's clearly the type of player that Chelsea need to add to, um, to, to add to their jigsaw. And the coach knows exactly what he's getting. They've worked together very, very successfully. Um, but uh, I wouldn't imagine it's one for the long term. It's a season and a half. And then surely he's a declining force, although Mina will probably disagree. Yeah, it's weird. I've always had a weird thing for him. I've always thought that he's a good player. There's a lot been said about him, especially about his mental fragility. And, oh, you know, he's a bit of an emotional player. Can he do it? You know, like, let me just explain this. In Italy, we haven't seen that side to him except for now, Mina. Yeah. Like, OK, he's going to be the guy that misses cities. That's who he is. Yes. Um, but he can also score in many big matches and be the difference maker. I think that he didn't really like he wasn't the guy that disappointed me in the Champions League final I said many times it was Dybala and you can't just have Higuain do everything on his own it, in Napoli when he arrived he felt totally loved under Maurizio Sari Sari came in and was like yeah he's a bit heavy yeah he's this yeah he's that you need to work on this you need to work on that you're very good but you could be so good but you're just not doing it at the moment and there was a lot of criticism aimed at him but in a loving paternal type of way and Iguain didn't think to himself, oh, I don't like this man. He thought, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this, you know. And he had this best ever season under Mari Susari. Uh, he took all the criticism. He worked hard on himself. And 36 goals later, he was top scorer and he was the king of Napoli. They were creating calzones in his name, statues, whatever you want to imagine. And he loved it because the football worked for him. You know, he had the likes of Callejon and Insignia around him just building and... and playing and quick movements and he was the reference point and he loved it he thrived and of course he wanted to be back in a club that was going to win everything because he didn't think Napoli had the chance and he's right you know and Juventus obviously deposited the money it took him and he didn't he scored a lot of goals and he didn't get to 36 but what he learned to Juventus was a little bit different he was no longer just a goal scorer he was now a guy that really helped elevate the game in the final third He's not the quickest guy, but he's actually very good at a counter-attack because of his positioning. He knew how to raise Dybala and, and, and sort of reinforce him at times and make him a better player. He was so important in the dressing room because he was so lovable. He started scoring in really big matches against Napoli, against Milan, when there was a lot of pressure and a lot of eyes on him, you know, who were like, maybe you're a little bit chubby, maybe you're a little bit this. He fought through all of that. He, this is not mental fragility for me. I feel like he's really fought hard to get there. But when you are MVP of a big club like Juve, um, especially in Italy, Juve are everything. Like you can't walk around where you're not being blasted by this team. You're the MVP. You're the fan's choice as the great player that they've got. You are carrying the shot, like everything. And then they decide they're going to go and get Ronaldo. Ronaldo is the reason why you left in the first place. Yeah. And so... And they tell you, you're the one that's going to move on. It's not going to be Dybala. It's not going to be Douglas Costa. It's not going to be Federico. But it's going to be you. And you, despite the fact that you're MVP and you've been the great player that you have been. 
and he's going to go to Milan. And he's offered, uh, Milan can't even make top four, yeah? They're really, really, really struggling. And they said to them, it's going to be a loan deal just because financially we're struggling, obviously. But don't worry, we'll bring you. And as soon as we get the funds, we'll, we'll make it permanent. It's just a formality. Don't worry, you're our player from now, you're our leader. Hmm. A few weeks in, Leonardo comes out and says, well, if we don't make top four, then Higuain's no longer our player. That's going to be a, a huge blow. There's no human on earth where you keep putting him in unstable conditions, where the team around you falls apart, where you, you've just done some of your, you've played some of your best football, you're voted MVP, and then all of a sudden the team doesn't want you. You're thrown to a side that can't make top four. Your sporting director is telling you there's a condition to, the, to, to your future and you're getting old. It's going to get to you emotionally. So yes, he did fall apart this season and he capitulated on when he played Juventus because he saw Ronaldo in front of him. He saw Ronaldo tell Chesney what to do on his penalty. And he just felt in many ways betrayed and he acted out and he was really stupid. And after that game, he couldn't score again. And he struggled until I think the 29th of December. But I just think it's a very human reaction. So I don't know if he is mentally fragile. I, I don't want to say that he is because I think that he's grown a lot. Is he going to miss 45 sitters? Yeah, but so do a lot of great players. So I think that he elevates the play in the final third. I think that he's got chemistry with Sadi, and Sadi is very stubborn about the players that he trains. If he likes you, you, he likes you forever. If he doesn't like you, you're out. He doesn't use a squad, you know? Tony in Liverpool and, says, can you ask Mina to stop sitting on the fence and tell us what she really thinks? <laughs> uh, Tommy Nesta says... <laughs> <laughs> Tommy Lester says, well, Tommy Lester says, uh, Tim, can you please tell us a bit more about Nahita Nandes, the Boca midfielder that's rumoured to be on the move, possibly to Leicester City? Yeah, and um, Cagliari are in pole position. Um, and Cagliari have, have a long relationship with Uruguayan players. In fact, they're, they're just bringing another one in at the moment, Oliver. Um, but Leicester probably have more money, so uh, we'll see. Nandes is yet another product of Uruguay's fabulous under-20 ranks. He was in their under-20 side four years ago and then promoted to the senior side. Um, what he is is, is is a midfield runner. You can play him wide, you can play him through the middle. He has a terrific engine. I don't think he's the most talented player in the world. I don't think he's ever going to be a, a truly outstanding player in, in European club football. But I think he, he can be a useful cog um, in, in, in your side because he gets through so much work. Terrific engine uh, and a little bit of versatility. But if he doesn't go to Leicester, it's not the end of the world. Oh, it's one for you. Uh, well, yeah, you know, uh, there's there's one for you, Revelino Junior. Uh, this is from Neil in Middlesbrough. His reverence. Yeah, his reverence. Neil in Middlesbrough wants to know what you think of John <laughs> John Obi Mikel coming to Middlesbrough on a short term deal. I'm so oh, yeah. excited. It's a Borough, Borough fan. Well, I saw uh, Borough the other week actually against Birmingham City. I live in Birmingham and I went with a friend and uh, they they didn't play very well. Um, they didn't play very well, in Middlesbrough. Um, they got the win in the end. Tony, it was a very Tony Pulis performance, um, and I think he'd do a good job in that central midfield. It astounds me that he's only thirty-one years old. Um, it feels like he's been around for the last fifty years. We Nigerians, we don't, <laughs> we don't age. Um, we just don't age. So yeah, and it'll be interesting to see what position they play him in because obviously he played in a deeper role for Chelsea. But um, I remember, I think it was even this World Cup. Um, he. Uh, played in a more uh, convention, like more number 10 kind of role. Um, so, yeah, I think it's a really good move for them. Uh, I think he could still um, do it at a lower Premier League level, so a very good move for them. Yeah, 08085 909 is our number. We're talking football in Europe and South America. The legendary you know, Tim Vickery's here. Take care of any questions you've got on South American football and players from over there playing our leagues. You've got the Colonel, Mina Rizuki, as well. Uh, she is interested in hearing your Questions on European football and players from Europe playing in our leagues as well. We've got the Ravelino Junior in the studio with us. Uh, he's, by the way, a, a uh, broadcast journalist uh, graduate. Are, are you actually a graduate or you're just doing a master's now? So I'm doing my master's now in that, yeah. but my undergraduate is in African studies. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, ooh. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, very, very, yeah, you're absolutely right. To, ooh. Did well, you focus on a particular area in Africa? Uh, I did my dissertation on South African cricket, um, actually, so about race mm -hmm. and development in that. You should have done it on West Indian cricket. It would have got you online know, now to give us a running commentary. <laughs> but you see, you make your choices, you take yeah. whatever comes as a result of it. So lots of questions for you both. Um, yeah, what about this one, actually? David, sorry, Duvan Zapata, Mina. Uh, oh, Mark God, and Beige... Yeah. 
Uh oh. No, he's wonderful. Okay, because yeah. Mark in Beijing says, uh, "I'd like to hear what Mina thinks. Whether she thinks Duvan Zapata is more than a one-season wonder." What a great, you know, words for a, a book title: one-season wonder. Yeah. Mm. Say that about a few people in life. Um, <laughs> Duvan Zapata. <sighs> Well, he's actually a cousin of Christian Zapata, who is a defender at Milan. Um, he He's playing for Atalanta, and he has been honestly ridiculous, okay? When he came in and I watched, I watched, I remember the first match I probably watched of theirs was against Roma, Atalanta. And, and at the time, you just think, okay, they're, they're better in their progression, but obviously Roma has better players because every year Atalanta has to sell some of its best. Um, it's famous, very famous for its youth academy in Italy. So everyone goes to them. Um, they find the best youth. They develop them wonderfully. They've got Gian Piero Gasparini in charge, and he's the best at getting the best out of youngsters. He knows how to talk to them. He's like the youth whisperer. And he is very much beloved in, in Italy for his ability with the youngsters. And Atalanta has just created this fantastic team, and they have done for a while now. And they brought in Duvan Zapata, and they decided to put Papu Gomez as a number 10, who's obviously their striker, was scoring left, right and centre last season. And Gasparini decided to play him as a number 10 to get the best out of Zapata. And he was sensational in that match. He was just, his pace made the difference. He was athletic, he was clever, he knew where the spaces to attack were. And he, you just saw him being like, OK, well, this is, this is really good. Like, this is quite special on his behalf. But then Atalanta were good because... They'd been training for longer than Roman. They started their season earlier, so you thought, ah, oh, it's not anything special. Now, in these last one of games, he can't stop scoring. And against Frosinone over the weekend, okay, it's only Frosinone, but he got four goals. And that's like, I mean, he's at the moment leading the charts alongside Ronaldo and Quagliola. And for me, I mean, he has all the talent in the world. And I feel like he's reached an age where he loves the coach. He wants to really live up to the potential that many people saw in Italy, but he never sort of lived up to it. And under Gasparini, who is the master of getting the best out of you, it's working. Can I say to you, if he moves somewhere else, he's never going to lose that talent because he's always had it. Um, and, and I feel now he's just really motivated to express himself. So I don't think he's a one-season wonder. But then changing coaches, if he's unhappy with the situation, you never know. Mark in Glasgow, hello. Hello. I have a couple of questions. The first one's for Mina. It's regarding Sandro Tonali. Oh, yeah. he's, he's someone who I was caught my eye as someone who's been linked with a lot of big clubs in Europe, particularly in the Premier League in the last couple of transfer windows. I'm aware he's only 18 years old, but is he? do you see him as someone who can do as uh, Verratti did at Paris Saint-Germain and transition uh, fairly quickly to a bigger league um, with um, a much a bigger quote-unquote team than Brescia? Yeah, I mean, it is, obviously. I mean, they are coming from Serie A, and you're right to compare him to Marco Verratti because, obviously, he had moved from Pescara in Serie A, never played in Serie A, actually, and went straight to PSG, which is a lot of pressure to put on a young kid's shoulders. Um, and Sandro Tonani is being chased by everyone. And he's obviously at Brescia, uh, who have a notoriously difficult um, president who doesn't want to sell him, unless, obviously, it's big money. And he's been compared to Pirlo, uh, because of his intelligence, because of his his role. But actually, uh, the youth coaches at Brescia, at Brescia changed his role a bit. And they say he's, you know, he's very different. So he he's while he's inventive and the kind of guy that provides ingenuity and, and geometric passes and all of that, um, he's changed a little bit now. He he's got he's he's got physical ability, he acts like a veteran. Um, he knows how to push further upfield. He's there's it's the way that he thinks. He reads the game so quickly, which is I guess why you compare it to Pirlo. But Pirlo keep ch- kept changing his position as well at the time. But this is the guy that really is standing out in Italian football because it just seems to me that his movement is so composed for a kid. It's very difficult to know whether he can live with the pressure. And in Brescia, everyone's watching him, and a lot of players. You know, like Rodrigo De Paul, for example, at Udinese, who's also being watched. I mean, he's, he's obviously old, but older. But these kind of players, as soon as you hear a little bit of distraction, they tend to start changing the way that they are or 
or they get distracted or they stop being these wonderful players. But he is actually getting better and he doesn't seem to care about it. He's always he's got a, a good family around him. Um, he provides you co- uh, creativity. He knows how to make the difference in the final third. Um, he's great in, in set piece deliveries and he's fun to watch. Whether he can make that step up, it depends on the coach that he goes to and it depends on the style of play. He needs to be sort of the focus in midfield. And I think he needs to go somewhere where he's allowed to make mistakes, where he needs to understand the pace of the game. PSG was a good fit for Verratti because their their football isn't played at like electric speed at the time. So for him, it was moving into a new team. He had the likes of Thiago Motta alongside him and veterans that helped him move. If Tonali is going to move, where's he going to go? Liverpool are after him, for example. But is there going to be this immediate pressure on him to do something really special? Or is he going to have a chance to work side, to work alongside Milner and have someone who's going to tap him on the shoulder and be like, it's all right, don't worry about it, take your time. It, I just think it's more about the, the culture that he'll find in his new club. Mark? Yeah, I think that was brilliant. My other question's actually for Tim. Right, and before that question, d- dare I say, fair for your honest, sonsy face, great chieftain of the pudding race, uh, boon them uh, yet take your place, paint stripe or fame, wheel or ye wordy o'er grace, as long as my arm. Well, thank you. <laughs> well, it, it is Burns Night, isn't it, essentially? It is indeed, yes. Uh, yeah, I just thought I'd, uh, I'd, I'd, I'd embrace the night that you've had into the phone. In yes, well. indeed. You're welcome. I've had a bit of haggis tonight. I hope so. I hope so. It is the chief of the pudding race. I didn't even know it was a pudding until mm-hmm. I read that. It is the chieftain of the pudding race, I thought. Yeah, that second question uh, is for 10 minutes about the... Um, you did it well. Go on. Uh, it's about the, uh, the Leonidas de Silva. Uh, he's someone who I've been studying of late and uh, there's... A story, obviously, about him uh, regarding a chocolate bar, which I mm-hmm. hope Wikipedia is not lying to me when I see this. Story. Um, it talks about him being uh, selling the rights to uh, a chocolate bar, and it's still a prominent um, seller in Brazil. Very tasty it is indeed, Diamante Negro. Yes, Leonidas da Silva um, is. Uh... The first truly global international superstar of Brazilian football. He was top scorer in the 1938 World Cup, where Brazil um, finished third. Uh, and they hadn't done anything in the in the previous two World Cups. And in South America, they were they were very much behind Uruguay and Argentina. So 38 is the breakout moment. And and still today, when people pick their best all-time 11s for Brazil. Many will put Leon- Leonidas at centre forward. He was uh, a little guy, extraordinarily flexible, and one of his nicknames was uh, w- w- was the Rubber Man. Um, he didn't invent the overhead kick. Some in Brazil will tell you that he did, but he didn't. He didn't invent invent it, but he probably did it as well as anyone. Uh, and it w- was a- an extraordinary, remarkable talent and a very difficult human being as well. I'm fascinated by the story of, how, of, of him missing the semi-final of the 38 World Cup. Uh, there's, uh, I've never really got to the bottom of that story. Um, it's said that he was injured. It's said that Brazil, in a, in a, in a, in a, uh, a fit of arrogance, rested him. I don't believe that. It's also said that he was got at. Uh, and uh, there, there were some bribes. I don't know... But I know from people who knew him that he was a difficult, difficult character. Some of the ones who came along afterwards, the great players, for example, the great players of the 1950 World Cup, and Leonidas nearly played the 50 World Cup. His international career ended the the previous year. But some of the great players from that 50 World Cup, they absolutely despised him because he, he, would, he would play the big star and he would be exactly the, the, the type of figure that, that Mina often rightly criticises, the big star who impedes the, the development of everyone else, who makes everyone else feel, feel uh, two inches high, a difficult fella to, 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 to get on with, who apparently settled down a lot later, l- later in life. Uh, but a truly extraordinary talent... Uh, and uh, one of the players who was very important in the professionalisation of Brazilian football. For me, it's it's one of the most important games in the history of Brazilian football. It's the end of 1932. Brazil go to Uruguay 
in the, the, the Centenario Stadium, newly built, had been built for the World Cup two years earlier. Uruguay are the top dogs in the world. Brazil win 2-1. Leonidas, uh, young centre forward, really shines. Uh, and the two best players are him and uh, a centre back, uh, Domingos da Guia. Both of them young black Brazilians. You're pointing towards the future and that future really be, uh, becomes concrete when Brazilian t- football turns professional. And the thing that helped it turn professional was that Uruguay, the two big clubs in Uruguay, Nacional and Penirol, one of them bought Leonidas, the other bought Domingos. That external shock was crucial in speeding up the process of professionalization in Brazilian football. And once you have professionalization, you have <laughs> some degree of meritocracy. So then, without professionalism, there's no Pelé. So that, that, that's a vital moment in, in the development of Brazilian football, and Leonidas is, uh, is right at the heart of it. And just to round this off, it's great that we've, we've got a caller from Scotland because it gives me the chance to pay tribute to someone who's just left us, who is an absolute, in- the great sports writer, uh, Mr Hugh McIlvanny, the all-time great. And when I, when I decided to go down this road... Um, what I did, I bought, went out and bought McIlvanny on football. It's a collection of his football writing. And I read it again and again and again. In British situations, the absolute master of putting sport in its, in, in, into a social context. Uh, a lovely fella as well. I had the chance to, to, to meet him about 20 years ago now and, and, and tell him all of these things. Uh, a fantastic phrase from him uh, about sport. He, he, he relished its magnificent triviality. What a fantastic phrase. Yes, what phrase. a fantastic bloke. What an inspiration. Thank you, Hugh McIlvanny. I got to interview him. I didn't meet him face to face. Interviewed him down the line and a proper gentleman as well, as you've suggested. Uh, Mark, I know that you, talking of gentlemen, of, or, or, or you're interested in finding out an update on the gent who you might remember from last week, uh, went into hospital this week for an operation. I haven't heard from him, so I can't give you an update. But as soon as I can, I will. I promise that. Thank you very much. You're welcome. 08085-909-693 is uh, the number to call. If you've got questions on football in Europe and South America and players from over there playing in our leagues as well, uh, the colonel is here, Mina Rizuki, the legendino Tim Vickery is here, and uh, we've got our very own Revelino Jr., not to be confused with the senior here in the studio as well, Joel Dowson. Now, question... Um, oh, there's been quite a few questions, actually. Let's rattle through a few of these. Oh, you like this one, by the way. It's not so much a question, but a comment, Mina. Uh, Sean, in Cumbria, who's learning about football, says, Mina's a sophisticate. I Ooh, love, am I? Yeah, apparently so. I love listening to her and to all three of you. Uh, but it's like, oh, oh afterthought, and to all three of you. Thank no, you, that's not true. Yeah. I'm just critical of everything I've realised in my life. Yes, yeah. but... <laughs> yeah. Oh, by the way, <laughs> apart from that bucket at KFC, you're one of the few sophisticates <laughs> yeah. to be found. You, you ruined that, my legacy know, you <laughs> <didn't> <laughs> by exposing that. all Absolutely. my habits. Exactly. Yeah, didn't have to I was that. carrying this air about me. I was known as Miss Kensington. Exactly. And then you came in, you told them about <laughs> KFC, you told them about the stuff I drink <laughs> what are we supposed to say when people ask how did she get a shirt name well there's only one other colonel Julie says here's my contribution for Desica through now in a Brazilian shirt name Difficulto Pronuncio I like that Too short yeah, exactly. Too short <laughs> Too short was a great rapper Do you know Did you say that on purpose? I interviewed no, Too no. Short I oh, know Too Short was the original gangster rapper you know from Oakland, California I remember interview, when I moved to Los Angeles one of my first interviews was with Too Short and he really was Too Short Anyway that's another story <laughs> uh, What does Mina think of Barca signing Kevin Prince and why Barca don't trust Malcolm. <laughs> By the way, there's a little part of me that's a bit like, um, I, I shouldn't be happy, but there's a part of me that's like, Malcolm, you know, you did this huge thing. Roma wanted to sign you. They wanted to make you their star. You decided, you know what, Barcelona's in for me, so ciao. And then he goes, they don't care about him. He's now offering himself to Roma, and they're just like, yeah, that's not going to happen now. <laughs> um, so there is a part of me that's a bit like, haha. But, you know, Freud. Surely you know you're German. Freud, yeah, you can't remember yeah. German names, but you do know you're German. <laughs> Stop reminding me. If he listens to this, it's over. <laughs> um, but anyway. And um, 
Yeah, so I'm Kevin Prince Boating is a cheap option. I mean, he's a good player, to be honest. You know, he's he, he's not the world's greatest player, but he's a good player to be sitting on your bench. You can come in and try to do something. He'll be super motivated because it's obviously Barcelona. I think he's been really good for Sassuolo since he's come in. He was good for Milan as well. People were almost shocked that he wasn't bad for Milan. Obviously, when you're re- you know remembering names like Marco Van Basten and Lionel Messi and Luis Suarez, and you put Kevin Prince voting in the middle, it seems like it doesn't fit. But he is a talented player. He is, is sort of like um, desperate to sort of prove himself again. And I think that he's had a really good season this year. He's not going to be the guy that's going to light your fire, but he's going to be happy with anything that you give him, with a few minutes, with a, a game against a, a, a small team, anything. He's just going to be the perfect guy that for eight million, you bring him in, you allow him to do certain things. He'll he'll happily do everything that he's instructed to do, and he's got the technique for it. So why not? Mina, what's what's happened to to Coutinho at, at, um, at Barcelona? I feel like all this hype around him, and then there's rumours that Man United were trying to buy him this this January. And is he is he is he going to make it? Is he going to is he going to ever succeed? And Tim obviously can chip in on this as well. Actually, I'm interested. To, for me, I was surprised in the beginning that they were willing to spend so much on Coutinho. I, you know, my previous thoughts on him at the time when he was at Inter, I think that he really found himself at Liverpool. I was shocked that he would leave, but then you think it's Barcelona. I think there's a lot of players who have arrived in Barcelona and, and Barcelona expected to be buying all these players that were going to make the difference. And I don't think that they've done enough to extract the potential. I'm struggling to blame any of the players that they've brought in because it seems all of them are not living up to their expectations or what is what is supposed to be true of them um and it one of them is obviously Coutinho and it 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 just seems to me like it's all falling apart under Valverde I don't particularly think that he's the right coach for them I think that he's a good coach for right now um but Usman Dembele they seem to always say okay he's not very well disciplined he doesn't come in he doesn't do it he's not waking up on training he's got, got the right attitude and yet every time the guy plays he scores a goal and saves them so it's like maybe you need to figure out a way of they, making this work for you because obviously this guy is talented obviously he makes the difference and Coutinho they're struggling because of the formation changes as well they played a 4-4-2 last season, which not many people were happy about because Barcelona were all about the 4-3-3. And then it's like, all right, we need to fit in Coutinho, we need to fit in Artur, we need to fit in Ousmane Dembele. And they now feel that he's not the guy that can provide them with everything they wanted. And I feel sorry for him because I think he had a great thing going in Liverpool. He arrived at Barcelona and his dreams are being shattered. And now you know why both, both, both Mina and I were dubious when he came to Liverpool. You know, because they picked him up. There's a reason that they picked him up for 8.5 million. You know, exactly. Inter Milan threw him away. And Inter Milan had a long, long term relationship with him and ended up throwing him away. I think he's, he has two problems one is position, the other is personality. And Barcelona originally, they said they bought him as an Iniesta replacement. Is he a genuine box to box midfielder? Brazil went down that route. They tried that in the World Cup. They still want to go down that route. But and, and they point to stats showing you that he, he that, that, that the ground that he covered and the sprints that the, 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 but your eyes were telling you something different. Your eyes were telling you that he wasn't marking effectively, and uh, uh, in in uh, attacking terms, he became less and less effective. The more that the the, so the, the why competition was he so effective for on. Liverpool. What was the difference? In Liverpool? Hang on, hang on, hang on. Okay. Um, so f- first problem is position. Where is he? Where is he playing? Yeah. Barcelona this year seems to have decided that he's not an Iniesta replacement. That he's not one for the midfield trio. That he's one for the attacking trio. But no, there's the, the Messi and Suarez are fixed. There's one place, and Dembélé, as, as Mina said, is, is is doing the business. So you know, if uh, he's on the bench, there's no problem in that necessarily. That's what that's one of the reasons that you you have a you have a squad for. You know, how much Tottenham would like someone to replace Harry Kane or Deli Ali at, at, at this stage of the season? But it brings us to the other problem, which is personality. And all through his career, he has always struggled with steps up, always. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he. he he, he, uh, you see this through his Brazil career, and he was a disaster at under-17 level. Won the World Under-20 Cup, but he was a bit part player. He was a, he was a part of the supporting cast of Oscar. Uh, at senior level, it took him a long, long time. It took him years to to uh, get established in the team. Same thing with Europe, with a couple of exceptions. One is Pochettino at Espanyol. 
and the other is Liverpool. Liverpool, he got both things that he wants, that, that he needs probably. He got the right position and he got coaches who put an arm around him. He's a quiet, timid character. So you're worried a little bit that it's all a, a bit too much for him. It's not only the fact that he's not in the team at the moment. I know that this is a worry for people who, who, are, who are there, who are covering Barcelona. It's not only the fact that he's not in the team because, you know, only 11 can start. He can, he can still be useful in the bench. It's his body language and his general demeanour and he looks down, you know. Back to the, 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 uh, the, the opening point. There's a reason that Liverpool picked him up so, so cheaply. He, uh, he, he needs to be carefully handled. He needs to feel important and wanted. If not, then his, his head can drop a little bit. In conclusion, <laughs> is Felipe Cuchino a brilliant player or not? Yes. <laughs> yeah. I do feel sorry for him, though. I don't feel Barcelona have offered him that kind of support. That I, I don't think that Valverde really knows how to get the best out of him. They knew at the time that he was a shy play. He doesn't... He's, he's always been a little bit I, reclusive. Is that the right word? Is that what, you know what I mean by yeah, a little bit, works. you know, yeah, mm. no. withheld. And he's just constantly being like, okay, just, you know, every, every time that he does something, or you can almost hear every fan in the camp news saying, oh my God, just manage a simple pass. But he's trying to do the extraordinary because I think there's now all this pressure on him to make the difference, to score a goal, to spin something. You can't replace Iniesta. It's imp or, like the guy was one of the best players in the world. And Coutinho, you know, I agree with him. And obviously this is why at the time when he arrived at Liverpool, I'm like, yeah, whatever. Like, this isn't the greatest player ever because I didn't see that in him. And then obviously Liverpool made him a star. And I'm like, you found something that really works for you. But, you know, who can say no to Barcelona? I can. <clears throat> <laughs> <laughs> uh, Stephen in Belfast says, recently Leeds have signed Real Madrid goalkeeper Casilla. Uh, what, or Casilla, uh, what are your thoughts on him and his move to the championship? Again, this is probably his one for you, Mina. Yeah, I mean, it's quite hard to judge goalkeepers because I never really know what you're supposed to sort of like look out for. He, he was How many considered... goals they let in? <laughs> It's quite hard because, you see, this is the thing, right? There are some goalkeepers that are easy to judge because they have a style or you can say... Because he was, was a huge was it, a prospect for them and they believed in him. And and I think he's a guy who needs to have... You know, you need to obviously have the right synergy in front of your defence. If you're... You know, when you have Virgil van Dijk and then you have a defender who's a leader, it makes the job of the goalkeeper that much better. And sometimes you can have a good goalkeeper, but... They, it's clear that the defence don't believe in you, so they start falling deeper and deeper, and then it, you feel like they don't believe in you. I know I'm getting out of hand now, but I was just talking about Chesney before the show, so maybe that's what it is. He's a, Obviously, he understands what it means to fight for all the top honours, and he's quite reactive, he's good with his feet, and he, he's nothing exceptional, but I think that this is... Um, I think it's a bargain to get him. I would definitely get him if he's available for me, considering their position. Yeah, and I'm I'm a Leeds fan as well, Dawson, and um, I think it's the Bielsa effect. This, this yeah, move. that's exactly what it is. Like he would not, no one from Real Madrid is moving to Leeds United without without Bielsa being there, and and Radrizani's uh, investment as well has been a, as a, a real good thing. And uh, the Leeds keeper this year has been a guy called Bailey Peacock Farrell. He's an academy graduate, and he's done pretty well, but he's made a couple of silly mistakes. Yeah, one against uh, Nottingham Forest springs to mind, but um. But no, I'm excited, um, and hopefully, I just I just hope we can keep going for till the end of the season. Uh, so, uh, how much have you been spying on me during the broadcast? <laughs> uh, just about another 24 minutes of this program to go, which means uh, we're going to have to go down to a quick fire round because there's so many texts and emails as well. We're talking football in Europe, South America, players from over there playing in our leagues. Oh yeah, and now we're talking football in Leeds. Yeah, Leeds is a little mm. a little city in the north of South America currently, at least as far as their manager's concerned. They do things differently there. They don't mind spying on each other, unlike us, of course. Um, and the Reveille No Junior is here with us, Joel Dowson. Will I be ab able to ever return to Ellen Road, having said that? I think it will allow it. Um, I think you sure about that? Because you're about to come back into the Premier League, aren't you, next season? <laughs> I'm, I'm really holding my breath about that because yeah. I, I, it was something I wanted to talk to Tim briefly about anyway. The whole kind of, and, and Mina probably knows about it as well, with Bielsa's seasons in Europe as well, the kind of 
the second, the, the third third of the season where it all kind of slows Good down test. for Bielsa's team is is, and especially yeah. with the, the the manic schedule of the championship and. Uh, thankfully, I think for us, we've gone out of the FA Cup early, which is really sad to say. Mm. Um, but I don't know if we'll last. And I think, um, and we've had a couple of negative results recently, so I'm quite apprehensive. So, Tim, before I mean, ask him, uh, Joel, all her questions about Bielsa. Do you, do you want to tell him will it last or not? Well, yeah, the, the, that, that's the that's the big question. And when he he's won very few titles, as he, he's always very happy to admit. No, I've never met anyone who who enjoys putting himself down as much as as much as Bielsa does. He loves it. He loves saying, you know, sorry for him seems to be the easiest word, not the hardest word. Um, but it, the titles that he won in Argentina year, years ago now, or when they still had the short season, you know, the twenty sides only playing each other once, nineteen games. Now that's significant. Because it's a it's a very very draining method of play, very very intense, uh, and we've seen in his his previous seasons in in Europe with uh, with Bilbao and and with Marseille that he's he's burnt the players out. They, they don't have enough gas in the tank in the final third of of the season. And you look at the championship, you look at the number of games that there are in the championship. That is the big fear and the big question mark that still hovers over. And we won't know until kind of mid-February onwards. That's when, uh, that's when the question mark comes out. Uh, so uh, until then and during then, buckle your seatbelts and enjoy the ride. Mina, far away. What do I think of Bielsa? Will it slow down? No, I, I thought you had questions for Joel. Oh, sorry. I was like, I thought you were asking me for my opinion <laughs> no, on something. No, 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 no. Um, I would never ask I you for your think... opinion, surely. Obviously, you, you love him, right? Yeah, I think... And the whole kind of Spygate thing is, is, I think, is added to the love of the Leeds fans. It's just the, the audacity to come out and just show what he's been doing for all this time. It's just brilliant. And do you think that that is cheating? No, I think I think it's 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 just it's ethically ambiguous. I think I'd say I think it's one of those where the, the person is technically doing nothing wrong. He's on pub, he's on public land. He's looking into private property, but he's 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 not trespassing. I think it's. You've just got to come up with innovative, innovative ways to kind of get a, an advantage over an opponent, and uh, I think it was. I think it's that's something that I think he said he's done for most of his career. So why not keep it going? And if I was to tell you that you're going to obviously reach the Premier League, and then you're going to have a great run in the top six, and then it's all going to like end, and it's going to be disastrous when he leaves, and it's going to be like three years of madness, would you still take the take the offer? I, I I think I would. I think it, the, this season has been so ridiculous. Like you, you, we're never out of any game. The, all the games have been entertaining. Really, we've scoring loads of like goals. I think, and I, I I started supporting Leeds basically when it all went downhill, when the financial crisis kind of hit, and we got relegated and went into administration a couple of times. Um, so I'd love to see us back in the Premier League. Obviously, I'd like to see it consistently. Um, but uh, yeah, I'd, I'd take a year of, of top six in the Premier League for sure. Mm, yeah, I agree. That's it, Mini. Yeah, no problem. I've got this good question. Oh, well, interesting question, I think, in any case, uh, from the old timer. Yeah, uh, he's given himself a Brazilian shirt name there, aka Jeff near Bolsover in Derbyshire. He says, Could Tim and Mina remark on scary looking football players in their regions? I hark back to the 70s when, in England, we had intimidating players like Trevor Hockey, Ron Harris, Chopper Harris, Chopper mm. Story, Tommy Smith, Norman Hunter, Bites Your Legs, etc. Tommy Smith? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Tommy Smith, he yeah, was, was a scary... Ferocious. He was... Would, I'd rather take I'm Chopper Harris now. than Tommy Smith. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> that is scary, oh, I love mate. it. I don't yeah, know. I'm, I'm, I'm scared terrifying. now as well when you think back. Yeah. Anyway, what players mm. make themselves... Um, look extra scary by, for example, shaving or growing extra long eyebrows or having no front teeth like <laughs> 70s Joe <laughs> Jordan. Enjoying Joe the banter, Jordan, by yeah. the way. Yeah. So from your regions, Tim, first, uh, scary monsters. Well, I, I'm, I'm not going to go for one from my region just because this one just leaps out of me when I think of uh, of probably the last time I collect, collected World Cup stickers. Do you remember, Is it was it Ivanov of Bulgaria? He was a wolf man. He was uh, the centre back in, in uh, the side that did very well in 1994, and he hung around for a while afterwards. 
But he, he, he just had hair all over the place. And he was probably one of those players, you know, when he takes his shirt off at the end of the game, his back is covered with hair as well. He was a, <laughs> he was a wolf. He, 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 he wasn't a human being. Uh, and, uh, you know, when, when Ivanov the wolf man kicks you, you stayed kicked. Of course. Uh, Mina, from your region, he stole one from you, but otherwise... I don't know. I'm trying to think. As a younger, as a youngster, it was Vinnie Jones that mm. scared me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know why. Vinnie Jones just... doesn't scare me because uh, we, we come from the same place and we're the same age. And I, I played cricket against him just before he made it big. He was at Wealdstone Town at the time. It was just before he went to Wimbledon. And he dropped me off his own bowling, the easiest catch you've ever, you've ever seen. So I've always regarded Vinnie Jones as a pussy cat. And he never hit you over the head with a cricket bat? Not at all. No, he Missed ran chance. the bar afterwards. He was a life and soul. Um, so okay. he's he's all right by me. He's Vinny. <laughs> there you go. Uh, but you know when he would like play sometimes. Obviously, he was obviously always quite aggressive. And then when he played his football, and you sort of see him on the pitch, and you're like, I would not want to be the guy playing in front of him. Yeah, especially when that photograph, that memorable photograph of him <laughs> in front of Gaza. <laughs> Let me just oh, leave yeah. it at that. If you haven't seen it, Marco Manchester says. Tim, please tell us about Paqueta at Milan. Mina, I'm not sure about Piatek at Milan. I prefer Catroni, Juve, mm. Own Var. What does that mean? Own Var? Oh, oh, own Var is in VAR. They own it. Oh, no. You're such a Milan fan. <laughs> okay. so, so what's that referred to? Why, why does he say that? Because he thinks Var is obviously going our way, right? Oh, right. Okay, I get you. Yeah, but, well, uh, and I don't blame him because of the Supercoppa. It was a little bit annoying, but... Yeah. So what about Piatek at Milan then? Um, it's spelt Piatek, but yeah. it's actually pronounced Piontek. Of course it is. Uh, so Christoph arrived from a Polish team, actually. I, I missed the gent. Um, and to Genoa for 4.5 million. And it was really weird. I mean, the guy just started scoring goals left, right and centre. And they had uh, Davide Ballardini in charge at the time, the coach. And this guy was just coming out of nowhere. He was scoring you know, four goals in a Coppa Italia match. He was scoring in every match in Serie A. And he just sort of came out of nowhere. But he was attacking spaces. He was motivated. He was tall. He was vivacious. And and he, he was unstoppable. I mean, he was scoring more goals than Ronaldo because Ronaldo started the season, like, dry. He didn't score, I think, until the third match or so. And so it was like, who is this guy? Like, where did he come from? And there's a backstory to this because Preziosi, who's the president of Genoa, who, the way he played, had missed out on Lewandowski at the time. And he was just like, oh, I'm not going to miss out on another player like this. So I'm going to go and, and get this guy because I, he was sitting in Ibiza. Someone showed him the video of Piontek playing and he thought, yeah, I'm going to take this guy. And he was amazing. Um, then Genoa changed coach. They went back to Ivan Foric. He stopped scoring as much because his, they changed his role a little bit. They asked him to do a lot more work. Um, and then they changed the coach again. Now they have Cesare Prandelli, who took them to the Euro final. And, you know, he's just a really great talent. And I feel a little sorry for Prandelli because he's obviously gone now. But it's only been four or five months. And yes, he scored a lot of goals, but it's a lot to invest in a player that's only been scoring for four months in, in, in this league. They, I mean, he was bought for 4.5 million. So... I don't know, but Paqueta has been really interesting for me, Nan, to be honest. When he arrived, there was so much um, gossip about him, all this news about him. We didn't know anything about him because he was coming from Brazil. But Leonardo kept talking about how brilliant he is. And he came and played the first game thinking he's probably going to be a little bit Brazilian in the style of football. It's going to take him a while to, to integrate. But tactically, very smart. His insertions, the way he reads the game, his he already seems to have chemistry with the likes of uh, Chalanoglu. And he understands how to, you know, give and go and, and, and run into the right spaces for his teammates to find him. And I'm like, wait, wait, this has only been like three matches and the guy's already making a difference. I don't know much about him. So over to you, Tim. Well, it, it's been a, a, a meteoric rise. I mean, two years ago, less than two years ago, he wasn't even getting on the bench for his club, Flamengo. Really? Uh, and no, and uh, there was one. They had one coach there, the, the Colombian uh, Ronaldo Rueda, who saw something in him, and gave him lots of chances. But he played in like less than two years under six coaches, and he got yeah. shunted around from position to position. He played everywhere. He played wide right. He played. I think he played wide left. He even played uh, improvised at centre forward. He played deep in midfield where he was a liability because he kept on doing nutmegs and stupid things and giving the ball away close to his own goal. And I think he found his best position playing, playing further up 
closer to to uh, to, the, to the centre forward. Very very talented, really talented. Lovely left foot, uh, and uh, and and sees things around him. But I'm quite Ooh. surprised that he slotted in so quickly because he is raw. Um, and he, and he, he got it, he got his uh, start for Brazil, and he he did a nutmeg on the edge of it, in uh, the edge of his own penalty area, and boy did he get a rocket from the coach. Now what on earth <laughs> are you doing? Because one of the things you have to do in football, you you have to respect the zone in which you're playing. You know what, what yeah. part of the field? That that's such an important thing. Uh, and uh, the interesting thing I think about him going going to Milan is how they'll work with him to make his decisions good to get his decisions better there's something of a i think he, he can he can overdo the the kind of narcissism a little bit there's something of the of the young david beckham around him in the the, the kind of narcissism sometimes um that Ooh. might need to be might might need to be flattened out as well yeah well it, it all it all happened very very quickly for him and when you're an idol with flamengo you are huge you know to so to go within the course of six months from someone who wasn't even on the substitutes bench, but uh, to someone who the, the you know the Flamengo fans, it's the biggest number of fans in Brazil are saying should be in the Brazil side. That's obviously going to go to anyone's head. You know, it'll go to my head, and I'm 53, let alone someone who's 20. Um, so he, he had to deal with that a little bit. And there, there were there were times when he was a little too precious on the field. He was uh, he, he was trying to do it all himself, and he wasn't taking good decisions. So that the speed at, w at which his decision making improves, that that I think is going to be fascinating. To watch at Milan. Mark in County down. Oh, sorry. sorry, no, you go on. No, 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 I'm sorry. It was just that it's, it's, I wondered whether because of Milan and the fact that it's Leonardo and Gattuso and Maldini in charge, whether there's that part of him that's a bit like, all right, I've got to buckle down and not do any of my like Perhaps. Nice things. Um, or whether Perhaps. he's going to yeah, just yeah. revert to old. I, I'm interested to know because he, at the moment, Gazetta can't stop writing about him. Like I was saying, Mark in County Down, uh, who's a West Ham supporter, by the way, originally from East London, says his favourite football team name is Sheffield Wednesday. Having a Wednesday in the name is unique, mm -hmm. I think. Although in other countries, don't they have a Thursday and a Friday somewhere or other? Anyway, do Mina and Tim have a favourite, and perhaps unique and different name of a team from Italy and uh, from South America? Oh, from Italy and Argentina. Santiago got, uh, Morning. I like Santiago the Santiago Morning, morning yeah, from yeah. Chile. It's, you know, because it, it, Santiago is, is quite beautiful in a way because you've got, you've got yeah. huge mountains in the background. So the idea of, like, you know, watching the sunrise on a Santiago morning, I like yeah. that. And do they ever play uh, an evening kickoff at all? <laughs> yeah, they, they do, <laughs> more often than in the mornings. Yeah. So it's morning rather than morning and grieving. <laughs> yeah, well, what about yeah. somewhere in Europe for you? Uh, it doesn't have to be Italy, anywhere, Mina. I'm trying to think, but most European clubs just name themselves after like. Uh, although Sheffield Wednesday was always a very interesting thing. What about an interesting nickname for a club? Yeah, yeah. About, like flying about... donkeys, Kevo, Kevo Fly, flying, flying donkeys. donkeys. Oh, yeah, yeah. Because uh, Hellas Verona, which is obviously the big team in Verona at the time, said that donkeys will fly before you make it to Serie A, and they made it to Serie A. <laughs> So they're the flying donkeys. Yeah, okay. so ironically, there. What about Leeds United? Uh, do you have a nickname? The, the Whites, I think, is just the. Is that it? I think so. It's so first of all, you've got a boring name for a team, Leeds I know. United. <laughs> I know. No, I'm being honest here. Yeah. You know, Charlton Athletic still sounds a little bit better, yeah, doesn't bit, it? It's a bit more. Accrington Stanley was I my think, favorite. Yeah, Accrington Stanley's one, a really yeah. good one. I like you, that one. You want who? Who Stanley? <laughs> <laughs> I also like. There's Accrington. Accrington. Solly Hall Moors as well. It's just a bit. Yeah. Just a bit odd. That... I think Wednesday still tastes mm, for sure. So you're called the Whites, yeah, I think so, as opposed to the Blacks. <laughs> <laughs> they, they weren't, they weren't yeah. even the Whites originally. No, were I know. They? You know, they did. Gosh, they became the Whites to, because they were copying Real Madrid. Oh, there you go. Yeah. You're well, not I embarrassed by that. Well, no, we, I think our boring name and our boring nickname is made up by having a good manager at the moment. So we'll just okay. we'll just As, take that for now. Yeah, well, exactly, exactly, yeah. exactly. Um, I like FC Hollywood for Bayern. I always wanted to be that team, you know. Mm. And could Tim? <laughs> this is from. I like that as well, by the way, Jerry the Milkman. And we do have a lot of Milkman listening to the program at all times. Very grateful to you all uh, for keeping it real, as it were. Uh, extra pints, if you don't mind, if you're the one that delivers to my doorstep. Now, could Tim please let me know what, or let me know anything about the new Crystal Palace goalkeeper, Lucas Per? Is it Perry? Perry. Perry, yeah. Yeah. Um, he hasn't played for Sao Paulo first team. So, uh, you know, he's not even, th you know, at best, third choice goalkeeper. 
He was Brazil's under-20 goalkeeper two years ago in the same side as, as Richarlison and Lucas Paquetá as well. Now, goalkeepers obviously developed more slowly. Um, now, São Paulo had the same goalkeeper for, for 20 years, Rogério Ceni, the, goal, the goalkeeper who scored more goals than any other goalkeeper. Filling his boots has proved a very, very difficult task. And obviously, São Paulo don't think uh, that Lucas is, is ready for that. So they're, they're happy to, to loan him out. So he's coming into the Premier League with very, very little experience, really very, very little behind him. Um, and to be a goalkeeper, I don't know what his English is like. I, w I would guess he doesn't have a great deal. You must be able to communicate with your defence. So it's going to take him time to be able to, to, uh, to do that as well. On the plus side, there was an English guy who, uh, who was assistant coach at São Paulo a couple of years ago. Michael Beal, who's now at, uh, uh, with Steve Gerrard at Rangers. And uh, Michael Beal rates him very, very highly indeed. So uh, one, one, one for the long term, but I'd be surprised uh, if, if, he, if he's pitched in, in in the next few weeks to, to Crystal Palace first team. I suppose all of us would agree that we need referees. Uh, United International Ref Strike, no pun, would cause ruptures and cost billions. Love them or hate them, we need them. Uh, says one of our texts. Mm. This was because of a story this week about a possible ref strike. Was it? Was that the story? Oh well. Anyway, uh, Frankie live well. I can't get an answer. I'll have to move on. <laughs> I just realised that none of us were blind. <laughs> yeah. What does? Uh, oh no. What about refs? Oh, this. Oh, this is this is the conclusion <laughs> of that first question. Frankie <laughs> Liverpool says, "What about refs? My nephew's refing under 12s and he tells me it's the parents who worry him because they don't know the rules. They don't know the rules. Well, yeah, I suppose. A any experience of that? Uh, I would never. Lino, I Junior? would never be a referee. No. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I, my, my, yeah. I've I've witnessed fights between parents on the side of pitches. I've as playing as a youngster and 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 refs getting involved. It's just it's just not something I'd put myself through. Okay. J it's like being a traffic warden. You just always get lots of stick. Yeah. 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 Are there any parents listening who actually do that? Uh, now, be honest now. If you've been uh, to watch the... If, if you're a parent or even uh, a, a relative of somebody who's been playing football, do you get involved? Do you tell the referee what for or not? If you do, uh, let me know. Text me very quickly on 85058 and I'll, I'll read out your defence of the haggis, as it were. <laughs> Joe in Dumfries says, Tim, has there been any fallout in Argentina following on from the violence of the South American Club Cup final before Christmas? And will the election of Bolsonaro in Brazil make any difference to the club game in Brazil? I wouldn't. Well, it, it may make a difference in, in sponsorship um, with all the privatisations and, and, and so on. There's one state bank which looks like it's going to scale. It, it, it sponsors nearly all the teams and it looks like it's going to scale back. So uh, that, 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 that might, might make a difference. Um, well, from, from this year, the, the Libertadores has a one-off final on neutral ground. So uh, we don't have the, the home and away final anymore, which is a big blow to, to, to tradition over here. It's a change that the authorities wanted to make. They're now in a stronger position to make that change after the violence that happened outside River Plate Stadium. Here's a question for Revolino Jr. from Brian in Chipping Norton. Who are the Peacocks? Oh, yeah, I was going to say the peak. I, it came to the back of my mind, but I didn't want to say it because I didn't want to be wrong. Um, but the, the whites is the one that's co most commonly used now, I believe. But uh, the so peacocks the, is another random one. I don't know why that's a... The, the peacocks is a nickname for Leeds United. Yeah, it's another one, yeah. And, and you've only just realised it. I didn't want to, I didn't want to get it wronged on live oh, on air. You know, I've got a reputation to keep up, so... Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. We're the addicts, by the way. Yes. I know that. Plymouth Argyle's a good name, though, for, for a football mm. team. Would everybody yeah. agree? Plymouth yeah. Argyle. Yeah. There's only one yeah. Plymouth Argyle, I think it's safe to say. And they're the Pilgrims. You know, I know that nickname. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I thought Arsenal was named after Arsene Wenger. <laughs> 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 that is good. <laughs> Like, um, that is one of those really embarrassing moments. Of course, he could have been named after Sharvin as well. Mm -hmm. But anyway, back. Jack from South China says there's a team in the Chinese third tier called Zebo Sunday. There you have it. That's a good name. Thank you. Yeah, it's not a bad one, mm. is it? That's a great uh, one. Yeah. Um, oh, and we forgot Dave Mackay in terms of hard men of football oh, or scary oh, men. Terrifying. Or Billy Bremner. There's, there's a photo. Well, there's a photo of Dave Mackay 
yeah. picking up Billy Bremner by the scruff of his shirt. Mm. And Billy Bremner was a hard man. Looks this like is, this apologetic little seven-year-old kid who's been caught stealing sweets. You know, it's such a great exactly, photo. That's exactly what Dave Billy... Dave terrifying. That's exactly what Billy, our listener, is referring to. That very photograph. So remember famous picture of him picking up Billy Bremner by the shirt after a particularly bad tackle. I think I've seen that one. Did you looks scary? Who? Yeah. I'd say Pepe's a scary looking Pepe. bloke. Yeah. Scary? Is he scary? He's scary on the pitch as well with him. He's scary yellow on the pitch. He is scary, but mm. I was thinking looking. Scary, would you say? Mm, like, I love him, Or Dynamo Kiev, good name, and Red Star Belgrade. Uh, of course, they've got a new name now. Uh, but both great club Belgrade. names. Yeah, yeah. They used to be what? Red Star Belgrade. I don't know what they're called. Yeah, Gravenna's Red Star. It's quite yeah. hard to say. But ben, I think that's how you say it. Ben in Hazelmere says, I was lucky enough to tour the old Fluminense ground and watch them play at the Maracanã last year in June. They seemed to be discontent with the ownership management of the club at the time. I'm interested to know if this is the case and if they have resolved any of these issues in the months since, Tim. They're in very deep financial problems, but uh, they've done an interesting thing. They've appointed a coach called Fernando Diniz, who's really interesting. He's from the, that kind of Bielsa-type Guardiola school, which is very rare in Brazil. Uh, and uh, it'll be fascinating to see how he gets on this year with, uh, with a young, inexperienced group of players. You've got to run in order to play that style of play. So at least he's got players, young players, who will run. Um, but uh, the, the financial situation is really, really worrying. They were sponsored by a, a massive um, private health firm, and once that sponsorship ended, the house has kind of slowly collapsed, and last year it looked like it was collapsing very, very quickly. Some people really fear for the long-term future of the club. Okay. Um, Red Can Bull... I ask a question? Yeah. Red Bull, yeah, Red Bull was a good one. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, go ahead with your question. Why are there not that many coaches of the Bielsa Guardiola thing in Brazil? Well, um, because the defensive line plays very, very deep. Um, there are lots and lots of games, and the easiest way to go about it is is uh, do it as safely as possible. Because the uh, the Bielsa Guardiola whatever thing, when it goes wrong, oh, it goes wrong because you're leaving so much space for the opposition to to, to counterattack. But can't they uh, do any tactical innovations? Here, no, there's, no there's, 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 there's very, very little of, of, of that. It, it's a very, very defensive mindset that there is in Brazilian football at the moment. Um, Sampaoli, Jorge Sampaoli, uh, mm. so disastrous with Argentina in the World Cup, he is mm. now in charge of a Brazilian team, Santos. And that's really going to be interesting to see whether he can implant high line pressure in the opposing half of the field in Brazilian football. There are already people desperate for him to fail. You know, lots of people would love him to... Because it, it, it's, it's a shake-up. It's new. And some people don't want that. They, 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 they want the old, you know, big defenders close to your own to your own line, play on the counter-attack, set pieces and counter-attacks. A lot of Brazilian football is, is decided on set pieces and counter-attacks. Yeah. I thought you were just going to say they don't play it because it's not that good. But Very anyway, quick yeah. one. If you can answer this in a sentence, guys. Alex says... Uh, why do you think it's important for the big clubs in England to still bother to develop their own local players when they can simply bring them in ready-made from clubs around the world, Mina? Because there could be a time where money runs out. Secondly, you have attachment to the shirt. Tim? Tim? Attachment to the shirt, and he's one of their own. The fans like it as well. The fans love being, re being represented by one of their own out there on the field. Revelino Jr.? I think it's really important for selling on money as well. You can you make more money from that kind of thing. So, yeah. Thanks very much. Thanks to Joel. Thanks to Mina. Thanks to Tim. Thanks for all your questions and texts and emails as well. This is BBC Radio 5 Live. 